So, a uh, short disclaimer. Uh, I might be wrong on my analysis. If I am wrong, please prove me wrong and tell me why I'm wrong. I'm going to task with a joke. And the joke is the one about the programmer found dead in the shower. I don't know if you know this joke, but it goes like, they find a programmer dead in the shower, they call the police, they call forensics, they do this investigation, and after a week or so of thinking and, and discussing what might have gone wrong in the shower of this programmer, they, found, they find that the cause of the death is the shampoo bottle. Because if, on the back side of the shampoo bottle were the instructions, wash, rinse, repeat. Okay. Uh, I am very glad to say that they fixed this bag. In a modern day shampoo bottle, you will find these instructions as it's in Spain, repeat if desired. So no longer are you obliged to keep washing your hair after eight hours of washing your hair. Now you can break the loop whenever you want in modern shampoo instructions. This is so good. This has saved my life so many times, guys. So why is this funny? If you start thinking about why this is funny, this is because this is humor by hyper uh, hyperbole. This is an exaggeration of how we think. This ability to interpret laws and norms literally is something that we do, we programmers do in real life. In fact, a few, week, uh, a few months ago, I was in a board meeting with uh, Angelos, and this happened. Somebody dropped off the video call, and we had to discuss the next point in the agenda, which was about this person, and they dropped. So we cannot discuss the next point in the agenda. We cannot change the agenda to skip this point because we need a simple majority vote of the board. Therefore, we cannot skip it. And we cannot end the meeting early because we also need a majority vote of the whole board and we don't have enough people. Congratulations, we are not stuck in this meeting forever. These are actual words by the OSGEO Foundation president. This is how we think. Also, I was told um, today that in, fo in the Phosphor G2013 in Nottingham, we had an incident involving an ambulance. Uh, there was a fire alarm in one of the dormitories, so one of the people in the dormitory panics a bit and wants to get off the building, which is a rational thing to do. But they encountered this door, which is fire door, keep shut, keep closed, do not go through this door, this door has to be shut. What do they do? They literally jumped out of the window. This is how we think, and this is important to know how we think about laws and norms, because I do believe that legislation works the same as program. Legal code is the same as computer program code. It is norms, conditions, and triggers that define and condition behavior. They are codified in an arcane language that you need to go to university and get two degrees in order to understand it. And they can, it can be interpreted literally, sometimes not for good end. So, what happened with this thing called the Cyber Resilience Act? Some time ago, people from the EU Commission thought, hey, it would be a nice thing, it would be a nice idea to, you know, do something about the security of computer things because there's this data thefts and these hacks with databases being open. We should do something about it. So they called the people who make all the European safety legislations, which are a lot. I took this list from something called the Blue Book, which is a how to do a, a safety regulation. Now, this can be grouped in roughly a few groups, things that explode, things under the pressure, and then tension, noisy things. But the common thing of all the things that there are safety regulations for is that they are physical things. You know, to create one physical thing, you need one unit of raw materials and one unit of work. And computer programs are not like this. And this, as I will try to explain, breaks everything. In and by itself, the Cyber Resilience Act is not a complicated thing. This is, in a nutshell, what computer developers, what programmers have to do in order to comply with the CRA. You have to, if you are going to release something, don't make it knowing that you have a SQL injection or whatever. Uh, do have a list of dependencies. I do think that everybody in this room, in the Phos4G and in, in, in the Linux and free software, free and open source software world, does have a list of dependencies in their software because this is how we do things. We must have a vulnerability policy, uh, a policy for vulnerabilities. We have to respond. If we get notice that we have a vulnerability, 
we have to give it priority over any other features or bug reports, and we have to offer updates. Pretty much every project in the free and open source world does this already. So this is not a hard thing to do. The hard thing to do is you have to do the paperwork for actually saying, I am doing this. That's the bit that is going to have a lot more friction. But then, after the European Commission sent the first draft of the um, CRA, the Apache Foundation and the Eclipse Foundation and the Linux Foundation and the whatever foundation, they all jumped in and said, what the heck? This is, this is, this is bad. Who has done this? Because one of, the, one of the things is that this is supposed to apply only to commercial software, whatever that is. We have had some talks about here in here about what commercial software is and is not already. And the idea of the EU Commission is that there exists something which is commercial software, and then in order to not hamper innovation or research, because that's why we use open source software for, right? Only for that. Only free and open source software supplies in the course of a commercial activity should be covered by these regulations. So hobby software is out, but any open source software supplied in the course of a commercial activity should be covered by this regulation. And when I was reading this thing, because I was interpreting this literally, because remember, I am a programmer, I take things literally, I started to think on how I am a maintainer of Leaflet. Ten years ago, I started being a maintainer of Leaflet, which means a Norwegian company is paying me, a guy from Spain, money to do a JavaScript library, which was created by a Ukrainian guy getting paid by a US company. So for me, being hired by a company is a commercial activity because I'm getting money every month. And then I think, what the do I have a responsibility to the people who are using the releases of Leaflet, which are not paying me directly? I don't know, because I am developing this in a commercial activity, and I don't care if anybody else uses it. But now the CRA might impose me guarantee uh, obligations towards the users of the, of the library, which include the bus company in, in, uh, in Estonia, amazingly. I don't know. I panicked, and then I wrote something, and then a lot of people wrote something, and then a lot of foundations wrote something, and the European Commission said, okay, maybe, maybe this is a serious thing, maybe we should do something about it. So I take my, my views from a talk that this, uh, this man, Javier Augusto Gil, gave in Spain last year. So the position of the EU Commission is that they have created this taxonomy, and they are going to put all software, all open, free libre open source software, they're putting it in one of nine boxes, depending on the monetization, who is getting money from this software, and who is governing, who is deciding over this software. And ideally, only one of those boxes, the one on the top, the one that is governed by one sole entity, and the one which is getting money from the same entity, only that free libre open source software is supposed to be covered by the obligations of the CRA. Anything else is not supposed to be covered by the CRA. And it's like, okay, the EU Commission knows about us and has gone to some conferences with the uh, open source software people. And I don't think there's a will to get us in trouble. They know that we are something important. I do not think there's a high risk for any free liberal open source software developer to be hit by a fine because of this. But it's still bad. The CRA, if you read it literally, it is still bad and it has loopholes. And that's something that I'm going to go through a bit after. What I think happened, and this is, this is my interpretation of what I think happened, this is how a, the market for physical products works. So you have a producer, then that producer sells to distributors and importers, also importers who get from outside Europe. Then that goes to a market because you sell and buy those things. And then you're going to put some punitive regulation there. That's where the safety regulations apply, more or less. And then the consumer just goes on top of that using the things that have the CE mark. So when you go, when the EU Commission goes and research how this software thing works, they go to the market, whatever that is, they, put, they talk to Microsoft, and they talk to Amazon, and they talk to Apple to see how, does, how are you getting money from this, how does this work, how can we put some legislation on top. They, they did talk to industry players before going to, the, to, the, to the flaws people. 
And then they discovered, oh, crap. There's this Libre software thing, which is done by scientists and weirdos and hobbyists and is all gratis and is not in the market, but kind of is in the market in some instances. So what we are going to do is we're going to get this mess, which we not, have not really analyzed, and we are going to make a vertical line over here, and on one side it's going to be commercial, and on the other is not is going to be non-commercial. I think that this is not going to work, because the reality is different. The reality is that there's no producers here. The reality is when you're talking about software, you're talking about intellectual property. There is no such thing as a manufacturer of software because the word manufacturer means make by hand. And you, not, you do not make by hand software. You make it with your brain, not with tools and physical things. So it does not work. What does work is the classic way of doing licensing, which is I sell you the license so I have a market of licenses. Then I can apply some punitive regulation on top. Then I can have a user of those licenses. And what I try to convey with this slide is that the interface, the interface in the architecture of this between the flaws licenses and the CRA does not work. This interface does not work. That's my main point. Because the people who have done the CRA have not read the intellectual property laws. Prove me wrong on this. I have read the whole CRA. There is only one mention to IP rights, and it's not about anything that's getting produced. In the whole of the CRA, there's no one mention that software is intellectual property. Not one. And this breaks the whole thing about licensing. So, and the, I, want to be, I want to get this very, very, very clear to you, because I have read the law, and I know how this works. When you're buying software, or when you're selling software, you are not buying or selling software. You are not buying or selling the result of human work. You're not buying or selling the, the, um, the ability to decide how to, uh, how to create the software. What you're buying and selling is the right to use the program. When I am working for a company in exchange for a monthly um, salary, if I, if I work for a salary from a company, in my contract, in my job contract, is going to be a small line which says, because you, we are paying you money, you are giving us a license to use all the results of your work. Okay? This has to be crystal clear, because this is what breaks everything. And this is how, this is how it works, really. You can have the program, you can go to the Pirate Bay, for example, and get a program, but you don't have the right to use that program. You can get the whole program, but not the right. It's something that can happen. And that's when we say it's illegal. I can actually pay somebody to give me a copy from the Pirate Bay of a program. And I will be paying for that program, but it will be illegal because of this. This is what is being bought and sold. And this is what the market is about. The market is not about the software, okay? Because this breaks the how a punitive uh, incentive works. You're selling rights, but the program is what breaks. So somebody is producing value, somebody else is capturing value. So the punitive incentive works on the money. Because the, the, the punitive incentive means if you're doing something bad, you will get a fine, you will get less money. So it, it, it works when people are getting money. But the people who are at risk of getting fined are the actual programmers, because the, the rights to the software uh, spawn from the programmer. They do not spawn from the company. The rights spawn from the individual programmers also, which is something that is not covered by the CRA, because there's this concept of manufacture that does not fit anything. This said, I'm going to go to loopholes. Uh, loophole is a vulnerability. Okay? Do you remember the part about legal code equals program code? A legal loophole is a program vulnerability. It's the ability to interpret the rules, literally, in such a way that you go against the spirit of the rules. It's the same very thing. 
So I saw this um, presentation by Paul Ramsey, uh, best better known for being the mind behind PostGIS. Uh, this is in PhosphoG NA, North America. I don't know if it's this year or uh, late last year. Uh, basically, he's saying that Amazon, uh, if you want a virtual machine in Amazon or S3 instance, you can get a Linux virtual machine for 33 cents of dollar per hour. And if you put a database on top, which is PostgreSQL, you get, uh, you get billed $57.9 an hour. So, okay, you make some numbers and it's like, Amazon, when you are doing PostgreSQL, you're paying Amazon 25 cents per hour for using PostgreSQL. Right? Right? Yes? Well, no. Of course not. Because there's going to be an army of Amazon lawyers who are going to tell you, oh, no, 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 no. What are you saying? Our customers are completely free to get the basic virtual machine and install PostgreSQL on them by themselves. We don't have to do anything. Therefore, we're not providing PostgreSQL because PostgreSQL is already there. What they're paying for is the, is the administration interface that they, that they use. And this is kind of right and so wrong at the same time. Because when, when the CRA comes, it's like the, uh, um, the Amazon lawyers, I bet that if the CRA comes to them, they're going to say, we are not in the context of a commercial activity. Because we are not getting any money for providing PostgreSQL to you because what we sell for money is the right to use PostgreSQL that we don't need to give you because it's already there. Even though we are running PostgreSQL for you and even though we are doing the copy of, Post of the PostgreSQL code for you, the thing that we sell, the thing that we could sell, which is the rights we don't need to sell. Therefore, we are not making any business. Therefore, it's not our problem. That's magical. So Amazon will not ever get into trouble, in my opinion, because they will have an army of lawyers defending this point of view. Let's talk about loopholes anyway, which is, you know, when you take something literally in order to go against what you're supposed to do. Uh, we know this text. If any, any of us who has ever glanced over a free software license has read something like this. This software is provided as is and without any express or implied warranties, including without limitation the implied warranties of merchantability and fitness for a particular purpose. This is in the licenses already. And this has been on the licenses for decades. And if you put the CRA next to it, it goes like this. The software license, the free libre open source software licenses, in a nutshell, in summary, they say this. You may use this software, this program, if and only if you acknowledge there's no guarantees. This is what the licenses say. I, this is what I will argue that the licenses say. You have to acknowledge that this has no guarantee. On the other hand, in order to distribute the program, you have to guarantee that it's minimally safe. You have to comply with the CRA provisions. So you put these two things together, and in my opinion, this is the result. Nobody has the right to use the program. This is an interlock. So we reach this, okay, we're stuck in this meeting forever, right? In the same vein, nobody can use the software. So the programmer is not at risk because <laughs> the programmer is not putting the program in the bucket because they can, they're not selling anything. The program cannot be used. And if anybody is using the program, I can sue them for infringement. So I, as a programmer, if this goes on, I can interpret these licenses literally in conjunction with the CRA and start suing people for using my software. I'd see no problem with the CRA. That's it, okay? Uh, and just to finish, uh, I think I'm making my points clear enough. Just to finish, my radical approach to this whole issue is taken from a book from uh, Lawrence Lessig. Lawrence Lessig is one of the lawyers that created the Creative Commons licenses back in the early 20, uh, 2000s. And his book says, in a nutshell, uh, this, this is one of the claims of the book, which is for me the central one. The internet should at least force us to rethink the law of copyright. Because it is clear that the current breach of copyright was never contemplated by the legislators who enacted copyright law. 
So in my opinion, the only way to make the CRA sensible is we have to tackle intellectual property rights. Because we, in 2024, we have been doing flaws for 30 something years. We have GPL, we have gone through Creative Commons. We know that this leads to accumulation of money into the big industry players. There's, monop there's practically mon practical monopolies on software. And the only way to tackle them is to think what we want to do with intellectual property. Because if not, we are going to have this weirdness of manufacturers which are completely dislocated from reality. And this is all I have. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your presentation. If there are any questions, comments, suggestions. Yeah, thank you very much, Ivan. I've been thinking about the, the difference between like paid products that they have to follow the CRA and open source that, okay, let's say that we don't have to Let's assume that. But we know that every commercial product has a lot of dependencies on open source libraries. So the responsibility is from them if there is a problem in an open source library. So what's going to happen? That means that the commercial products are going to remove those third party uh, open source libraries because they don't trust them. They're going to really contribute them and make things easier for all of us. Anything else? Okay, so there's, there's several things that we have to think about here. One is what we want to happen, what we programmers want to happen, what the EU Commission should want to happen, and what big companies want to happen. Because we want different things, right? The consumer, the user, sorry, not the consumer, because software is not consumed, it, it is used. It is not destroyed on usage. The user will want to use something that is core, everything, everything is safe, and somebody has looked at every piece. That's what we assume that a user will want. That, that should be, in, in, in my ideal scenario, the opinion of the EU Commission. What we want to do is we don't want to get into trouble first, and we want to get paid also. I would like to get paid. And I would like to, to get some of the money. I bet, I bet you, and, and you can talk with Paul Ramsey about this, I bet you that the PostgreSQL developers would love to have 1% of the money that Amazon makes because of them. Okay, they would love that, absolutely. So what I do not want is to be responsible for something I'm not getting paid for. That's it. That's what I want to do. What a company, what a big company will want to do, and we're talking Amazon, Apple, Meta, Google, um, the likes. What they will want to do is, of course, they don't want to be responsible about anything. But they do have the army of lawyers. So in my opinion, what they will push for is the point I made with Amazon and PostgreSQL. They want to not have any responsibility of the software that they are profiting for. Okay, so the CRA says, okay, if you are distributing the software in a commercial environment, you need to be responsible for it. And the companies will say, I'm only responsible for this amount of software. The rest of it is just, I'm not making money out of it, right? So that's what will happen. There will be tension right now, so to speak, between the uh, mega corporations point of view and the individual programmers point of view and, and there will be a clash constantly unless we tackle this and I think the EU Commission should be aware of, of this because if the cookie law has taught me anything okay the cookie law has taught me a lot of things first that apparently a newspaper has 746 partners that they want to share my data with I mean I know about polygamy but that's not polygamy that's a that's four orgies together if you have 700 partners. Um, and the, se the, the other thing that the cookie law has taught me is that commercial entities and corporations will do everything in their power to get away from complying with the thing in a, in a, in a way that benefits the users. Because the cookie law was supposed to do what the cookie law was supposed to do 
was to only send you cookies whenever you're logging into a site. That was the main gist of it. And what it turned into, it turned into a sub-industry of consultancies. We're going to give you a consultancy so you can comply with this law, and then the freaking cookie pop-ups spawn. So what I think will happen because of this cookie law response is that the CRA will enter into effect and that there will be a, a consultancy sub-industry that will sell you the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The certification for the CRA. There will be companies that will certify you for the CRA, which is just saying, yes, 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 yes. You're having a repo, you know your dependencies, you will, you, I'm sure, I'm super sure that you will respond to CVEs when they reach you. So there will be a company that will grab, I don't know, 10,000, 20, 50,000 K of your money, and we'll give you a nice certificate that you can present on the EU Commission. Say, I am, I am certified, there's this company that says that, I'm certified, I'm okay. And then, of course, stuff will keep, will keep happening. And they will get away with it because they will have the army of lawyers defending the thing and saying that the certificate is fine, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Meanwhile, us, the poor, poor, as developers, as lowly developers, we don't have an army of lawyers and we cannot pay 10 to 50K for a consultancy and a certification. Certifying is going to be a hard thing. And I don't know how the OZO Foundation is going to face it, to be honest. I, I have so, so many doubts about it. But this is how I think it's going to go. I don't know if I answered your question, but that's how I think. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight that uh, if you are a, a big company like AWS or Google, I'm, I mean, 15,000, it's not that much as a fine. But it, if it's you nothing. Are, if you are Joana Simões or even Sanchez, then you may think uh, twice before you, you, you create a code. So this is discouraging small, um, I, I mean, basically people that don't take profit for their, their software. So, so my question was, who is uh, ultimately accountable for, uh, for this? Is it the developer that wrote the code or is it the organization, the project? Who is going to pay the fine? Um, I'm going to reply as a lawyer would. It depends. It depends on how you interpret the law. So, so to make a, a, a metaphor, a simile, uh, do you know that the same Python program might be able to run differently if you use Python 2 or Python 3? It's the same program, but you run in different environments, and you might get different results. And you might even engineer the program so it produces wildly different results in different platforms or different runtimes. So the same thing happens with law, like, like the CRA. If you ask me, my output of interpreting the CRA will be one. And if you ask the Amazon lawyers or the Microsoft lawyers, the, and the, the output of that interpretation will be another. So who is responsible for a vulnerability? I don't know. I don't know. Because from my point of view, from my literal point of view, since what you are buying and selling is a juridical artifact due to the creation of software, the software is created by the developer, by the physical person. And then that is, that is the act of creation of the, this juridical artifact, which is the rights to run the program. And you can sell the rights, but you cannot sell authorship, especially in Spain. Especially in Spain, you cannot sell authorship. The authorship remains with the person, in, independently of who they, they, they have been hired by. So in my opinion, since the creator of the software will always be the person, the responsibility will fall into the person. Because the, quote, manufacturer, quote, is the person. That's my literal interpretation. That raises a question, because obviously if you are in an open source software, you can just go and check who wrote the code. But if you are uh, an organization like Esri, or, or I mean, the code is not uh, <laughs> open. So how, do, how can they know, how can the European Union know exactly who wrote the, that code? I mean, are they going to ask for an audit first, of, of the, the code? First. It seems very complex. First, and I'm going to be perfectly clear about this, First, you would have to sue the ass of the company 
because they are not respecting the moral rights of the individual programmers. And I want to say this publicly, loudly, and very clear. Spanish law, under Spanish IP law, the right of authorship is unwaivable and unalienable, which means you cannot sell it, you cannot get away with it. You cannot be a company hiring a person and not say that this person has made this software. So first off, we should do go back the last 40 freaking years of software development and start saying this, this software has been made by this and, this and this and this and this and this and this and this person. Because that has been illegal for 40 years and will be illegal still. And since nobody sues and nobody does anything, companies keep and keep and keep and keep and keep doing this. So first we have to solve this, that is already illegal. If I could, if I could, I would start suing everybody. I would sue Microsoft Spain. I would sue Esri Spain. I would sue, sue Google Spain. Because none of them has, have been respecting this unwaivable right. It is an unwaivable right that has been, um, oh, God damn it. It has been violated over and over the years. So we should fix that first. Since nobody cared, the, the problem is, the, the, the problem that generates on top of that is, since nobody has cared about that unwaivable right for decades, the common perception of all of us is that that right does not exist. So right now, if you, if you, if you ask any Spaniard, do you have an unwaivable right for your software? You don't, because your software, all your, all your work life, it has never had your name on it they have taken your name out of your software for your entire life. So you know that right assist. Yeah. So you're like, I'm not. That's a problem. I'm not joking. So we should at least, we should start by complying with the law. We need to comply with the existing intellectual property laws. We, we, we want to put more law on top of a mountain of laws that we're kind of complying with but we only comply when the big companies are losing money? We only apply intellectual property law when somebody big, such as Sony, Warner, Microsoft, is losing money? When, when the law says that the individual programmer has a right to have their name of the software, and that's unwaivable and unalienable, unalienable. Nobody cares. We need to start, you know, start complying with the law that you haven't done for 40 years. So thank you very much. I don't know about you, but I don't ever want to upset Ivan. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for the presentation, for the discussion. Uh, at this point, we are ending the final slot. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Katarina. Thank you all.